Hi everyone, welcome to our teleseminar, Ignite Your Healing. I am Dr. Sarah Gottfried, the Harvard-trained integrative physician who helps women feel sexy, ripe, and delicious again using natural hormone balancing. I'm also the author of the forthcoming book, The Hormone Cure, to be published by Scribner in 2013. I'm joined today by Dr. Lissa Rankin, my dear colleague and friend, and author of the book, What's Up Down There? For those of you who, who don't know Lissa, She's trained, like me, as an OBGYN, but she practices the medicine of the future, which she defines as updating and feminizing the broken, outdated, patriarchal model of medicine. And that's a way of conceptualizing medicine that we both share. She empowers patients to be their own doctor. She helps patient, patients craft what she calls the prescription, which is our topic today, a patient-guided approach to a sick treatment plan that bolsters all facets of womanhood yet is also grounded in the most current science. So, Lissa, how about if we start there with your new thinking about this new paradigm of medicine? Can you start with some of the, the fundamental aspects of that? Absolutely. Well, l let me give you just a little backstory for anybody here who doesn't know my backstory, because those of you who do know me know that I have had this on again, off again love affair with medicine. Like, we're like that couple that, you know, they just keep getting back together and then they keep breaking up and you never know whether to, you know, say anything about them. Like, oh, thank God, I knew you guys weren't meant to be together. <laughs> medicine yeah. and I have been like that since I was about seven. And I have quit medicine and come back, uh, I think, three times now. <laughs> um, and I've almost quit probably 20 more times, go dating back to college and med school and residency and, and when I left my managed care practice five years ago. So I came to realize after leaving my own practice that I had started in December, um, I thought I was done for good this time. And then I realized that it really wasn't medicine that I was frustrated with. I, I've always loved medicine. I've always felt really called to medicine, which is why I keep coming back. But what I realized, I was able to kind of finally distinguish that it wasn't medicine that I didn't love. It was this broken, outdated patriarchal system that was frustrating me so much because I knew how I wanted to practice medicine, and I felt really constricted by the system, by the kind of managed care-driven um, doctor on a pedestal sort of physician as god model that uh, that i had been taught to practice and that never ever resonated with me and even just the definition of health i think a lot of people think of health as like you know you're healthy quote unquote you're healthy if you're absent of disease and you exercise every day and you eat healthy organic meals and you manage your stress in effective ways and that's absolutely critical those things are absolutely critical. It's, it's critical to balance your hormones. It's critical to make sure your vital signs are normal, all of those things. But to me, the definition of health is so much bigger than that, and it includes not just the health of the physical body, not just your mental health, but also your professional health, your spiritual health, your sexual health, the health of your creative life, you know, your environmental health, kind of your relationships, your interpersonal health, all of these facets of what makes us whole. And so in what I'm calling the new medicine, I'm using the term whole health, which on my, on my blog at owningpink.com, I, I use that interchangeably with the term mojo, <laughs> um, as in I lost my mojo and I got it back. And whole health for me includes all those facets of health beyond the physical body because all of those facets also affect the physical body. I mean, it's been the, the medical literature, when you look into it, there's tons of studies that show that if you're in toxic relationships, it damages your health. If you are, you know, going to a job that you hate, you're more likely to suffer from health problems. You know, if you're having financial problems, it's going to affect your health. If you're in, you know, if you're not expressing yourself creatively, it's going to be detrimental to your health. If your sex life isn't great, it's going to hurt your health. So all of these things actually have been scientifically proven, as you know, Sarah, to kind of um, tie back into our, our physical health and not to mention our life and our happiness and sort of why we're here on earth, our life purpose, and all of those bigger, more exciting things that affect who we are as people. So 
kind of the, the foundation of that, the new medicine for me is expanding that definition and bringing healers and patients on board to say, hey, it's all of these things are related. And we can't just look at the symptoms of the body or the diseases of the body without looking at all of these other things. So, for example, in my, in my medical practice, my intake form is, is really long, and it includes questions about all of those facets of what makes us wholly healthy. I love it. I love it. And I, I want to take that piece of feminizing the old model. I want to take that piece in particular because I, I think you're incredibly good at it, but I want to get more explicit about yeah. how is that yeah. different? How is it different from the old model? Can you tease that out a little bit for us? Absolutely. Well, you, again, you know the answer to this, Sarah, too, so feel free to kind of chime in on your own here because I know you understand this. But a lot of it for me begins with the doctor-patient relationship. And I think I certainly was taught, like, this is what you do. You go to school for 12 years to learn to be an expert, and then you earn your white coat, and you stand up on a pedestal, and you talk down to people, and you tell them, I know more than you do about your body, and so you're going to come to me when you're not feeling well, and I'm going to dictate to you what it is that you should do, and then you're going to go home and hopefully take my advice. And if you don't, I'm going to get angry at you. (laughs) And that never, ever resonated with me. I never felt that way. I also was taught you shouldn't feel. And I remember one night when I was a third-year resident at Northwestern, and I had what I called the night of four dead babies. Because in one night I had to deliver something like 13 live babies, but I had to deliver four dead babies in one night. And every time I delivered one of those dead babies, and of course I'm sobbing, the woman is sobbing, and I'm I'm taking this dead baby and literally crawling in bed with my patient so that I can hand this dead baby to her mom and hold the mom while she sobs and grieves and, and deals with this loss. And, you know, I was exhausted by the end of the night, and by 4 a.m. after delivering the fourth of the dead babies, I literally was crumpled in a heap in on the floor of the locker room. And I was in the women's locker room, and there was my teacher, who was a man, was standing at the door with the door open. He, he couldn't come in. It was the women's locker room. He's standing at the door yelling at me, buck up, Rankin. You're never going to make it in this job if you can't stop feeling. And, and there's two midwives that were holding me in their arms on the floor. And the two midwives were saying, Lisa, don't ever let them break you. And to me, that's that's a lot of it. That's that feminine, that feminine approach, like... I didn't want to be a doctor who didn't feel. I wanted to be able to feel. I wanted to be able to listen to my intuition. And and yet I was I was exposed to all of these pressures from the outside that were trying to make me a certain way. And I found myself about 8 years into my practice starting to become that way. And that's when I left medicine for the first time because I was like I cannot let this happen to me. I refuse to be that kind of doctor. And so I've just stepped more and more fully into my feminine power. And for me, that means as a physician, not only tapping into my feminine intuition and my healing wisdom about my own body, but empowering my patients to do the same. So that the doctor-patient relationship, and when I say doctor-patient, I'm talking to every acupuncturist, (laughs) massage therapist, yoga teacher, like everybody out there who's doing healing work. So I'm using that as sort of a broader term, but I'm really talking about healer-patient relationship. By changing that so that that relationship is a partnership, and my job as doctor is more the job of teacher, Um, so that I can educate and offer tools and invite um, my patient to call upon her own healing wisdom, that always radiant, never extinguished divine spark that lies within all of us that I call your inner pilot light. And I invite my patients to sort of call upon the healing wisdom of their inner pilot light to partner with me so that I can teach them what I know and I can answer their questions, and I can educate them about what's going on in their bodies. But then their job is to do the same thing to me. They have to teach me (laughs) what's going on in their body and what their inner pilot light is telling them about what's going to work for them. Because if I dictate a prescription that's based on how I was trained and what I think is going to work, but it doesn't resonate with the healing wisdom of their inner pilot light, it's not going to work. And then the patient gets frustrated because she's not getting better. I get frustrated because she's not getting better. And we both feel like failures. And, and, And that's not the goal. I mean, the goal really 
is to empower the self-healing mechanisms that we all have within us. Because our bodies know how to do this. Our bodies are miraculously designed to self-diagnose and self-repair. And even Our bodies we, know and we forget. We do forget. We do forget. And it's so tempting to hand over our power. And, Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, to just say, I'm broken, so fix me. And that, first off, that puts a lot of responsibility on the doctor. If, if you're broken and it's my job to fix you, then I'm going to feel stressed out. And if you don't get better, then I feel like it's my fault. I'm a failure as a doctor. Whereas if I tell you you're not fixed because nobody – or you're not broken because nobody is ever broken, you're whole, and it's really about reclaiming that wholeness and writing the prescription for yourself – so that you can get clear on what elements of your whole health might need to be bolstered in order to step more fully into that holy, healed, perfect self that is your inner pilot light that's always whole, healthy, perfect, and healed. And that might mean calling upon the tools that you and I have to offer, Sarah. So that might mean someone's intuition says, I really need bioidentical hormones. So they come to us and they say, I really think something's off in my hormones. Maybe it's my thyroid. Maybe it's my adrenal. Maybe something's off with my sex hormones. And so we can help them. We can educate them. We can empower them. And if their inner pilot light says, yeah, that's, that's it, you know, my, my lab tests are off, that's really going to help me, then awesome. But if, they're la- you know, if their inner pilot light says, oh, no, I'm not going near hormones. That is not for me. I think I really need to, you know, go to yoga class instead, then you know, fantastic. So it's really about kind of empowering those self-healing mechanisms that we already have. And we know from all the medical literature that the body can self-heal in miraculous ways. We see it all the time in what we call the placebo effect. So this is happening all the time in scientific literature when people are given a sugar pill or they're injected with saline. And 30 to 75% of those people in those clinical trials get better with the combination of a, an inert treatment or a, a sham surgery even and a therapeutic relationship with somebody who believes in them. And when you mix those things together, it really empowers those self-healing mechanisms. So a lot of my research and what my book is about has been about kind of really empowering those self-healing mechanisms in my patients so that they can write the prescription for for themselves in a way that really is a more feminine approach by kind of grounding it in your inner pilot light and listening to the healing wisdom that lies within us all. I love it, Lissa. You know, the the story you told about being a third-year resident I think is so profound, and I think it's something that all of us, as OBGYNs had as part of our training, where you're supposed to be completely divorced from your emotion. That's the patriarchal model. And yet, as women, we just don't feel that. I mean, I had the same experience of midwives who managed labor in a way that made so much more sense to me than this very medicalized way of doing obstetrics. Right. And just the trauma and grief that you experienced that one night as a third-year resident, and I can just feel that professor in the doorway telling you to buck up, buck up yeah. Rankin. And just this, this idea of shifting from the very power imbalance patriarchal model to a more collaborative um, connection with patients that's without pretense. Exactly. So appealing, so appealing. And when you, when you talked about this idea of a woman coming in to see you or me wanting bioidentical hormones or kind of tuning into that inner pilot light, I just was thinking about root cause and how you and I were taught this model of kind of a disease-based model where you figure out what works for a population that has a condition, say menopause, and you figure out the five treatments that are effective and you apply them across the board, right? You and I were taught to give Premarin and Provera to women who have menopause. Right. And yet that's not, that doesn't get to the root cause of the issue for a woman who's having hot flashes and may benefit from a different treatment. You know, maybe bioidenticals are a good choice for her, but maybe yoga is the way for her to balance her estrogen. So I want to get back to this, this inner pilot light because I think it's connected to root cause, you know, root cause for a woman. Right. Can you tell us more about the inner pilot light? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm going to I'm going to start just by by telling you one of the first questions I ask my patients 
they, you know, people come in with a them. And the first thing that I'll say, and when I say a symptom, I'm not just talking about a physical symptom because people all come to me because they need to be, they need to heal from a divorce or they need to heal from loss of a loved one. So their symptom might be, you know, grief or loss or trauma or, or something. But it often, even those things often manifest as a physical symptom. They, they have migraines or they have stomach pain or, or they're having hot flashes. But the first thing I ask people after they've done my long intake form is, what do you need in order to heal? And when I started asking that question, really what I'm asking them is, what is your healing intuition? What is your inner pilot light telling you? And when I first started asking that question, I really honestly thought people were going to share treatment intuitions with me. I thought they were going to say things like, oh, I think I'll choose craniosacral therapy over physical therapy. Or I think I'm going to wait on that you know, cholesterol-lowering drug and try changing my diet instead. Um, but what I found is that the stuff that came out of people's mouths, it absolutely blew me away. And it usually blew them away because they would say things like, I have to quit my job. Or it's time to finally tell my mother the truth or I have to get out of this abusive marriage. And the two of us would sit there and look at each other like it was usually a shock to both of us that I would ask them this question, what does your body need in order to heal? And those were the kinds of answers that were coming out of them. And this was like three years ago, really kind of when I started working in the integrative medicine model. And that was, that was kind of the beginning for me of, of the new medicine, of kind of recognizing this new model that, wow, it wasn't just about treatment options, that it was about root cause, because that's what you're talking about, Sarah. It's like the root cause is I'm, I'm in this soul-sucking job that's draining the life out of me, and it's making me have hot flashes. Or I'm in this abusive marriage, and I, you know, it's leading to me having symptoms of fibromyalgia. So I was really shocked when I started hearing those answers, and I also realized why it's so tempting for us to hand our power over because if that's what it takes for the body to heal, that's scary for a lot of people because if you're listening to that self-healing intuition, that, that a lot of the time is commanding big change. It's saying, I need to stop smoking when you don't want to stop smoking or I need to do yoga every day when you don't think you have time to do yoga every day, or I need to move to Santa Fe when you really thought you were going to spend your whole life living in Boston. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, learning to listen to that is, it takes a great deal of courage. But I think within us we do have this part that I, that I call the inner pilot light, and you can call this whatever you want. I mean, call it your feminine wisdom, call it your intuition, call it your – your Buddha nature, your Christ consciousness, your divine spark, your highest self. I think all of us have this part of ourselves that we were born with, and it has never gone away. That no matter how many bad things have happened, no matter how many dark nights of the soul we've experienced, there is this always radiant spark that lies within us. And I, I have my clients close their eyes and sort of imagine in their body where it lives, because it's different for all of us. But this spark within us, when we can tap into it, and my, my book includes a lot of kind of tips for tapping in, and I can share some of those if we have time. Um, but when you can tap into that inner pilot light and let that inner pilot light guide you with not just how to heal the body but how to live your life, and, and, and by doing that it's really about tapping into that truly authentic part of yourself, then magical things can start to happen. And again, this requires courage because living a truly authentic life and being willing to actually be who you are and say what you think and question your doctor and make radical change, that's not, that's not for the, the faint of heart. This is for the exceptional patients, the people who are willing to do anything to overcome whatever it is that's holding them back. And these exceptional patients, they have been proven time and time again in the medical literature to be able to cure cancer. They overcome remarkable odds. They overcome heart disease. Like they, they shock their doctors. Their doctors, they come back to their doctors five years later after they were given a three-month death sentence, and, and, and they say, oh, by the way, remember me? And the doctors don't know what to make of them. Those are the people that have managed 
to really tap into that inner pilot light when they've mixed that with a life wish where they've decided, you know what, I am, I am done with whatever's holding me back and I am going to do whatever it takes to get well. Not just well, to, to be vital, to be kind of what I call skyrocketing to the stratosphere. I love it. I love it. I mean, this <laughs> is really differentiating feeling okay. I'm okay. I feel okay from feeling vital, feeling like you are most fully who you were meant to be on this planet. Absolutely. And that's a really important distinction. And in fact, I, I struggled a lot with language in trying to write the prescription because a lot of my patients, you know, as OBGYNs, you and I, we're not cardiologists. So we don't tend to attract the patients that just had a heart attack. Um, and as integrative medicine doctors, I think this is even more the case. Most of my patients that come to see me are not actively, quote unquote, sick. Um, most of them have gone to their doctor because they don't feel like something's right. They're fatigued, their energy levels are lagging, they're depressed, their sex life sucks. They sort of feel out of touch with their life purpose. They feel spiritually disconnected. Um, and they may be having physical symptoms, but often it's not, you know, cancer. Those people wind up at their oncologist a lot of the time. So, um, I end up seeing a lot of people who have gone to their doctor, their primary care doctor, and been pronounced well. They're like, we did your lab tests, your lab tests look fine, your vital signs are stable, um, and, and yet they have this like mojo-sucking epidemic that seems to be, you know, really a attacking the modern developed world these days, especially among women in my experience. And so I, I, I had trouble with the language of this, and I came to realize – I think there's actually like three different categories of what I call sick, meaning, you know, the, the identifiable presence of disease. And then well, where your vital signs may be stable and your labs may be okay, but you're not necessarily feeling vital. And then the next step is what I've come to call whole. And if you look up the definition of healing, it means to become whole. So for me, to become whole is to be vital, to be authentic, to be tapped into your inner pilot light, to feel that joie de vivre, that sense of being radically alive that, well, people may not necessarily feel. And the part of the paradigm of the new medicine is recognizing that you can actually, I actually believe you can be both sick and whole. You can't be sick and well at the same time. But you can be sick and whole. If And, Sarah, I know you've been in this situation, any doctor has, where you've been at the presence of someone who's dying, who is dying after having lived a remarkable life. And these people can be absolutely whole in the moment they take their last breath because all those other facets of what makes us whole are completely um, in, in touch intact really their, their re relationships are incredible they've left no love unspoken they've achieved their life dreams they haven't put off until tomorrow what they wanted to do today they are creatively and professionally and relationally and sexually intact like they've they've kind of lived a whole life even in the moment where the body gives out and and so you know, if we can be both well and whole, like that's where, that's where really miracles start to happen. Absolutely. And I think the problem is I see that mostly in people who are dying. And how do we take that wisdom? How do we take that sense of wholeness and bring it into our 30s, our 40s, our 50s, our time of greatest vitality? Absolutely. Well, I and think for, sounds, for me... I can speak for me personally. It, it meant personal crisis. It wasn't me dying. It was my father dying. And I went through what I came to call my perfect storm. Um, this was almost like five and a half years ago now, where I gave birth to my daughter. My 16-year-old dog died. My brother wound up in liver failure as a side effect from the antibiotic Zithromax. And my beloved physician father, who was only 59 years old, died of a brain tumor all within two weeks. And it threw my life into a total turmoil. And I realized I was not living an authentic life. And I was living for the future, not in the moment. And I decided to start my own self-healing path. 
and I was so wounded from my medical training and so wounded from even practicing medicine. I was, I was living in post-traumatic stress. And I, I just decided I was done. I didn't want to live that way anymore. I wanted to live knowing that if I got a diagnosis like my dad did, he was diagnosed and died within three months, that I, that I wanted to be able to say that if I knew I was going to die in three months, I would be living exactly the same life that I'm living now. And I can honestly say, and to me this is my definition of success, I can honestly say that if I found out right in this moment that I was I had three months to live, I wouldn't change a thing. I'd still be on this phone doing exactly this with you. So here's Sarah. <laughs> I love it. Now, I want to just make a quick aside to those who are on the web, the webinar and also on the call, that if you want to type in any questions for Lissa, you can do that in the chat box that's at the bottom right-hand side. If you're on the call, we don't actually have a mechanism for you to ask questions. But for those who are on the webinar who have a question, go ahead and put it into the chat box, and we will ask Lisa those questions towards the end. So you had a perfect storm, and that perfect storm got you to really change up the way you were living your life. And I'm interested in how women can do that without a father dying, without their own health at grave risk. And it sounds well, to me like this new book that you're writing is about that. It's about how to access that deep vitality without, the, without the crisis, perhaps. It is about that. And, you know, honestly, I suspect most of the people that are going to buy my book are people who have had a crisis like that. I, I wish I could say that I thought people could, you know, be – 20 and healthy and happy and having everything going perfectly in their life and be motivated to take the steps to really live and achieve vital whole health. But I, I, I've come to think that for a lot of us it takes a crisis. I don't think it has to mean your father's dying or you're, you've got cancer. But I think it means kind of getting your equilibrium shaken a little bit. And like I said, that might mean losing a loved one. It might mean going through a divorce. It might mean losing your job. It might mean an empty nest. It, you know, it might mean a health crisis of your own. I would like to think that we could do it without that. And certainly the book is written so that people can do that. I just don't know that people are motivated to do that. Sarah, what do you think? Well, I... I actually think that there is a way. I think there's a way to decide that there's something that's not working about your life, to hear a calling, as you heard, without a crisis. I think you can do that. It requires a lot of focus. You know, I, as you know, I, I'm a yoga teacher and a meditation teacher, and so I believe that there are ways to access these more fundamental truths without a crisis to trigger it. Well, I, I guess I guess I I totally agree with that, and I guess my answer, my resolution of that would be that when you're listening to your inner pilot light, and there's a whole section in the book about how to listen to your inner pilot light, and if any of you feel like you're out of touch with your inner pilot light, I have a daily email that I send out to my readers called the Daily Flame that you can sign up for. And, Sarah, I know you're going to send it to people afterwards, but they can go to owningpink.com. Uh, backslash daily flame dot html or they can go to owningpink.com and there's a little icon there that they can click on and it's messages from your inner pilot light to you and i think what happens sarah is like you're saying when you know that something's off in your life i think what happens is that our inner pilot light starts speaking to us in whispers and those whispers if you're doing yoga and you're meditating and you're really you're really in touch with your inner pilot light, you're listening to that healing wisdom, then those whispers may be kind of telling you something's off, let's, let's, let's shift something. And if, like me, I was not doing those things, I was not doing yoga, I was not meditating, I was not listening to my inner pilot light five and a half years ago, and so I had to get thwacked on the head with four major life-changing things happening within two weeks in order to wake me up. But I, I do believe that those that are really awake and really in tune and really tapped in can listen to those whispers and start tapping into that guidance without the crisis. So when I say it takes crisis, I think most of us are not that tapped in. We're not that tuned in. We're not making the effort to be um, paying attention. 
Um, but for those of us that are, absolutely, I think we can avoid the crisis. I think we can avoid the, the health crisis. I think we can avoid, you know, necessarily having the universe need to thwack us over the head like I had to get thwacked. Does that make sense? And it absolutely makes sense. And I, you know, I'm a big fan of prevention. I think prevention is a hard sell in our current broken patriarchal model. And what you're talking about is listening to the whispers as a mode of prevention. Absolutely. And I want to take this, you know, I'm a big fan in these webinars of really giving practical information to people so that they're not just hearing about some of the ideas that we have, but they actually get some ideas for what to integrate into their life right now. Can we, is now a good time for you to talk about how to tune into your inner pilot light? Sure, Can you give us sure. one or two I'll tips on that? I will. I'll actually give you a little preview from my book. So here's a list of tips for igniting your inner pilot light that's from my yet unpublished book, The Prescription. The working title is The Prescription, Five Spiritual Steps to Healing Yourself from Illness, Trauma, or Loss. So one, you tapped on this already, is meditate so you can hear the voice of your inner healer within. And you can do this in moving meditations. This can be through yoga. It can be through sitting meditation. You know, we know that this benefits your physical health in many ways, but it also lets you listen to the song of your soul. Um, one of the things I have my clients do is invite your body to write you a letter or invite your inner pilot light to write you a letter if your body isn't the problem. So, you know, if your neck hurts, ask your neck to tell you what's up. Dear Sarah, uh, love your neck. <laughs> And, and really let any physical symptoms that you're having or any emotional things that are coming up talk to you. Um, move your body. I think dance is incredible for this. Um, I love Nia, Debbie Rose's Nia technique. I love Tony Bergen's journey dance. Um, yoga, of course, also fits into that, moving your body, letting your body speak to you. Um, invite yourself to be honest about how you feel. I think so often we stuff our feelings. We don't want to actually listen to those feelings, and we wind up with physical symptoms because those feelings get kind of stuffed down and they manifest as these physical things. So let it all hang out and feel what you feel. Unleash your heart. You know, I think many studies show that behaving in a loving way improves your physical health, but so often in this world we feel like we can't do that. We don't give ourselves permission to, to express the love that we feel. And doing so actually lets the love come back into you, and that feeds your inner pilot light. So follow your bliss. This is a great way to light up your inner pilot light, is really listening to what your body wants in order to be happy. Like, follow your pleasure. Do what brings you joy. Um, let, you know, step into the gratitude of what makes you happy because happiness boosts your immune system. It affects the body in many ways, decreases your cortisol levels. You know, the happy people have lower rates of depression, high blood pressure, cancer, infection, all of these sorts of things. So following your bliss, I think, is key. Um, you know, consider what you feel tempted to do, but don't. So often we squelch our genuine desires because we're trying to fit into a society and we think there's this mold we're supposed to do and we walk around wearing these masks to, pretending to be who we're not. And in doing so, we kind of we, we miss out on stepping into our own desires. I was just talking to my daughter, Sienna, who's five years old, and we do these little mama mojo tips, and she just asked me this morning. She said, Mama, give me another mojo tip today. And so my mojo tip for her this morning was – Dance when you feel like dancing. Because yesterday we were out in public and she wanted to dance and somebody told her not to. And I was like, do not tell my daughter not to dance when she feels like dancing. And I think it starts so young. It starts at, at, at that age where we want to do something. We want to say what we feel. We want to do what our body wants to do. And, and we're, we let that get kind of squelched out of us. Um, you know, another tip for me, getting out in nature is great for my inner pilot light like I get so recharged just going to Mirror Woods and hiking around or being out on the trails in the Bay Area where we live Sarah um, another important thing I think is creating a room of your own if you don't have any physical space to be quiet it's really hard to hear the whispers and you're more likely to have to get thwacked on the head like I did <laughs> I have lots more I won't go on. Go on a retreat. Let a trusted friend mirror your inner pilot light back to you. Read books designed to light up your inner pilot light. And more importantly, 
insert what works for you here. Like ask your mm-hmm. inner pilot light what it needs in order to get lit up because it's different for all of us. It is different for all of us. And I, I love how your list is actually a very feminine list. <laughs> I was I was thinking when you started off talking about tips to connect with your inner pilot light, if you asked my husband this question, he would say, okay, well, here are the five systems that are related to my inner pilot light, nutrition, sleep, right. energy. And, you know, it's a very male model to look at right. it that way. You're looking right. at it in a much more kind of holistic, meandering, feminine way. So totally. I applaud you for that. Well, the new model, and this is beyond the scope of what we'll have time to talk to you about here, but the new model, which is the whole second part of my book that I'm teaching in the new medicine, is what I'm calling the whole health cairn. And it's a, a, it's a model of kind of balancing all of the facets of what makes us wholly healthy. And, and the foundation stone of this model is the inner pilot light. So literally, in the whole second part of my book, the chapters are divided into things like creativity, spirituality, physical health, mental health, you know, your work slash life purpose, your relationship, sexuality, those sorts of things. And I, I end each of them with kind of tips that might help you balance that facet of your whole health. So tips to make you more creative, tips to, you know, to improve your sex life, tips to help you get in touch with your calling. But then at the end, there's a meditation of how to tap into your inner pilot light so that you can figure out the tips for you. Because, again, I can tell you what works for me, and I can share with you the things that have worked for my patients. But ultimately, that's the feminine part of it. Like, I can't tell you what's going to work for you, no matter what, no matter how much experience I have, no matter how many years I went to school, no matter how many patients I've helped. Ultimately, it's about helping people, empowering people to listen to the voice of their own healing wisdom and then supporting them in the process of implementing those action steps that they will come up with. And that's what the prescription is for me. It's a self-guided, a patient-guided approach to um, taking action towards being living a more vital life. So at the end of the book, people are going to have the prescription and it's going to have a list of action steps that they have crafted based on their own inner healing guidance so that they can actually put into play a plan for living a more vital life, even in the absence of crisis. Hmm. That's my goal, at least. <laughs> I love it, Lissa. Now, I getting back to sort of practical advice for the people who are on the call, how can – people start to experience the prescription. I know your book isn't going to be published for a while. You've talked about ways to connect to the inner pilot light. I also was thinking about these three categories that you gave of health. Is that the, is that the way you framed it? Sick, well, and whole? Right, right. I well, think it might know, be helpful just to spend a moment to have people who are on the call define for themselves which category they fit into. Could you speak to that a little bit and um, and then maybe talk about ways in which women can start to experience this new paradigm that you're describing? Well, let me answer the second question first, which is if you're on this call and you really kind of want to go a little deeper into this, we are about to roll out a whole program, including a lot of free offerings for people who are following me on owningpink.com. So certainly if there's anybody here that's kind of wanting to dig deeper into this, we, we, we're not quite ready. We were, I was hoping to have this free product available for people on this call. But do me a favor, and anybody who's listening that wants to be introduced to that free product, which is all about helping, um, helping people uh, get in touch with their inner pilot light and learn to build this whole health care that I'm going to be teaching about, um, send, a, send my assistant an email at melanie at owningpink.com, and we're just going to make a list of the people that are interested in getting more information about this. And we, you know, we'll, we'll keep your email really safe. But it, send an email to melanie at owningpink.com, and we'll make sure that you get an invitation when that comes out. And I'm also going to be launching um, an e-course that's based on the information in the book that's going to come out long before the book does, because the book's not going to be out for at least a year. 
So for those that are ready to kind of start working on the prescription, that's going to be the best way to get in touch with that. So, you know, follow me on Owning Pink. I'm going to be doing a whole blog series on Owning Pink called The New Medicine that is about all of these philosophies, and that will all be available at no, at no cost. So there's going to be a lot of information, and people who are interested in, in kind of getting that information, you know, at no cost, um, just send an email to Melanie at OwningPink.com and, and sign up for The Daily Flame which, again, it's free. It's Monday through Friday in your inbox, and it's just short little daily inspirational messages from your inner pilot light to help you listen to the whispers. Um, and as far as identifying um, you know, whether you're sick, well, or whole, I actually have a blog post that's going to be coming out that goes into detail about that, and it's, it's, we only have, I think, a couple more minutes left, and so I don't know how much time I have to dig into that in detail. But again, I would invite people to tap into their inner pilot light because some people who have an illness do not define themselves as sick at all. They, you know, they, that's not really how they define themselves. They, they define themselves as maybe somebody who has something in need of healing and they're on their way to wholeness. And some people may feel whole already. Uh, again, all of this is going to be stuff that we're going to be rolling out. And I'm doing this call a little prematurely because we haven't done that yet. There's going to be a quiz that people can do about how to tap into which facet of their whole health might need to be bolstered. There's in, you know, information on how to get in touch with your inner pilot light. So um, once all that is rolled out, I promise people will be able to really dig deeper into all of that information. I love it, Lissa. So I've got listed on the webcast your, your uh, URL address. So both LissaRankin.com and also OwningPink.com as well as Melanie's email address. Perfect. Perfect. I also have my website listed, SarahGottfriedMD.com and our email address, which is info at SarahGottfriedMD.com. I want to go back to these three categories that you mentioned earlier on the call, the sick, well, and whole, because I, I think that the majority of the women who come to us are in that well category where their vital signs are fine, they're really not significantly ill, but they're not feeling vital. Right, right. And I feel like that's really the majority of women that we're working with. I suspect that many of the women who are on the call today are in that category. So Absolutely. can we recap just some basic truths for them? They're going to sure. sign up for your daily flame. They're going to get some of your future product. You know, one little side note here. I think you did this call in a very feminine way. So rather than <laughs> waiting until you had everything lined up and the whole package was ready to ship, right. you jumped in and you did this call with me, which I'm really grateful for. So that's well, part of the new <laughs> Because I love you, Sarah. I love you, and I wanted to support you, but also I'm so excited about this. I don't want to wait until all the little, you know, details are in place. And of course, my marketing people are saying, "Lisa, you're not ready to do this yet." And I'm saying, "But, but people need to know. It's they're they're already they're already ready for this." So, but yeah, I can recap that real quick for you, Sarah, if you'd like. So, yeah, please do. So let's just look at sick versus well. So in medical school, we were taught that there are two kinds of people, right? Like there's sick people and there's well people. And sick people have abnormal laboratory and radiologic tests, and they're considered diseased or ill, and they wind up taking medications. And if we manage to keep them from landing flat on their backs in hospitals or, you know, God forbid, keep them from dying, we breathe a sigh of relief as doctors. And if we manage to go a step further and help them make lifestyle modifications and, you know, that benefit their body from the from the root cause, then we kind of pat ourselves on the back and we consider our jobs well done. But so so that's sick people, and then well people on the other hand have kind of normal lab tests, normal radiologic studies. They're generally free of disease, or if they do have diseases, we've controlled them with medication or diet changes or exercise or weight loss or whatever is working to keep them well. Um, but it seems to me that in spite of all of that, like you know, we have medical technology advancing at this rapid fire pace, and yet disorders such as chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia and chronic pain syndromes and ulcers and things like this are still plaguing us, and people are still obese and hypothyroid, and even if they don't have any of those diagnoses, you know, they're depressed, and if they don't have depression, then they just don't feel vital. So let's talk just for a minute about well versus vital. 
um, which I'll, I'll interchange that with whole. Um, so there are these others, and they may not be sick, and they're mostly well, and their blood tests come back normal, and their vital signs are stable, and they get the clean bill of health from their physical exam, and yet something is missing. You know, you drag yourself out of bed every morning, and you trudge through your day feeling sluggish. You know you should exercise, but you kind of don't have the energy to schlep yourself to Sarah Gottfried's yoga class <laughs> or use that gym membership and – you know, your mood slumps often. You kind of feel listless and tearful and hopeless, and maybe you catch colds easily. And you know how to eat healthy. You know, you know how to prepare your healthy food, but you're already spending 10 hours a day slogging away at a job that you hate. And, you know, you just don't have time to make the food that you know is going to make you feel better. So you grab a frozen burrito or something out of a can, and that just makes you feel worse. And then you're already kind of just not feeling great about your life, so you're opening that third beer every night. And then you go to bed and you're having these sort of insomnia experiences and maybe you've got anxiety thoughts going through your head and you're kind of haunted by this crippling loneliness many of us feel. And so you numb yourself. You have this tendency to numb yourself with food or with something you're addicted to or, you know, things that generally aren't good for your health and you're sort of feeling lonely when you're surrounded by your friends, like nobody really gets you, nobody really knows the real you. If only people could know the you that, that would be there if you were letting your freak flag fly. And so it's really tempting to wallow and you wind up just showing up at the doctor a lot of the time saying something's just off. And, you know, part of you probably feels like you should just suck it up and accept that this is just your life. You know, maybe you should just get over it and quit hoping for anything more. Maybe life just doesn't have meaning and you're not here for some divine purpose. And this is as good as it gets. And it just breaks my heart when I hear patients saying things like that. Because, you know, I just want to scream at them like, no, don't drink the Kool-Aid. There is more to this life. And, you know, that's where when people can identify that, when they can sort of step into that and say, no, I I know there is something more, and I long to be whole. And when they're ready to do whatever it takes to get there, those are the exceptional patients that I see not only curing themselves from serious illness, but preventing serious illness from happening. And you see these people, and some of them are really old. I have this patient, she's like 88 years old. And she is just this remarkable woman. And I swear to you, this woman ha does not have a single health condition. And she is one of those remarkable people who just decided to be vital. And, like, I want to be her when, when I grow up. She has these birthday parties every year that are just these, like, out-and-out -out bashes. And she has these dance parties. And she has all these 80-year-olds that get together and dance. And they bray at the moon. And it's just the most adorable thing in the world. And I just, you know, I want to live my life that way. And I want to be one of those 80-year-olds that the – 30-year-olds want to hang out with because we're so vital. And I think it's possible. And I think that is preventative health, Sarah. And that is the feminine way. And we can empower our patients to do that. And they can empower themselves to step into that. And it's totally possible. Absolutely, Lissa. I love that you presented this state, the state of being um, well but not vital where women feel hungry, they overeat, they overwork, they overgive, and they're not feeling fulfilled, they're not feeling vital, you said it breaks your heart. And it breaks my heart too, but it's also this incredible opportunity. Right. It's a chance to listen to the whispering that can take you to a whole new level of wellness or wholeness or however you want to describe it. That so is exactly I hope, right. So I hope that that arc that you presented over the course of our call today really resonates with the women who are on this call and who will be hearing the webcast later because this is your opportunity to live a different life, to not have two glasses of Cabernet as a way of numbing out some of the feelings that are coming up, as a way of treating the whisperings that you need to attend to. Absolutely. And I think there's, there's also an important piece with timing, like when people are ready for that, um, we've got these resources that are available for you. Right. So 
people, let's just recap the resources for them. I think we've got just maybe one minute left. Can you just uh, list where people can find you and where they can connect with the, uh, the Daily Flame? Well, the best way to find me is owningpink.com. That's the website that I founded, and it has my bio and contact information. And on the home page of owningpink.com, if you look down on the bottom right, there's a, a link to, to sign up for the Daily Flame. There's, if, you, if you want a direct link, link to the Daily Flame, then it's owningpink.com backslash dailyflame.html. But owningpink.com will pretty much, if you, if you navigate around, you can pretty much find you know, how to access me as a physician. How to, you know, I'm about to be launching a program where I'm going to be working with 12 patients for nine months. If you're one of the people that's interested in getting an invitation for those programs, if you want to read my blog or re know more about the new medicine, that's, those are a good place to start. Perfect. And they can email Melanie if they're interested. And in Melanie at owningpink.com, exactly. So one of, if they want to be one of your prized 12 women <laughs> to develop the prescription. So you Absolutely. are going to develop the prescription with those 12 women. I am. I'm going to work one-on-one -on -one and in groups for an intensive nine-month program with women, those exceptional patients that are really ready to develop the prescription for themselves so that they can live vital lives for the rest of their lives. That's what we're going to be doing. I'm super excited about it. We're going to be launching that in just a couple of weeks. So once again, not quite ready, but we're getting there soon. Awesome. I can't wait to hear more about all that you're doing, Lissa. So thank you so much for being on the call with us today and telling us about your new book and your new paradigm of medicine. Fantastic. Oh, thank you, honey. I salute you. And thank you, everyone who's on the call. We're going to be sending out a webcast of the call and the slides that we have and all the contact information and all this juicy content that Lissa shared with us today. Any last thoughts that you want to close with, Lissa? Just don't settle for being well. Be vital. I love it. It's simple <laughs> and beautiful. Get vital. Get vital. It's, it's within your power. Don't settle. Life's too short. It is. Don't wait for the crisis. Listen to the exactly. whispers. Exactly. I love that. I'm, I'm going to write a post about that, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, Lissa. Thank you, everyone. And thank you. It was, it's been great being here.